Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, coming to, to our panel. My name is Lynn Ramey, and I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the Medieval Academy's Committee on Digital Humanities and Media Studies. So we put this panel together um, in response to requests from the Medieval Academy membership um, that came from our DH coffee hour at the Medieval Academy meeting in Washington, D.C. earlier this year. So we really want to thank you for giving us your input on that. And I also want to recognize the rest of the committee members who have worked on programming for this year and planning for next year. So um, many of them are here. Uh, Elizabeth Lastra, Rowan Doran, Victoria McAllister, and James Farr. And a special thank you as well to Christopher Cole for setting up this virtual meeting for us. Um, so our committee uh, will be starting a showcase of informal presentations and conversations around already existing DH projects early next year um, as kind of a celebration of digital humanities during the centennial, uh, build up to the centennial year for Medieval Academy. So we're excited about that and uh, please look out for information about that in future Medieval Academy mailings. and. Finally, uh, please stop by the DH Coffee Hour that we're sponsoring again to get ideas from the membership um, at the Medieval Academy meeting in Notre Dame this coming April, or contact anyone on the committee to let us know if you have some ideas. And I'm going to put at the end of the, the panel, I'll put up our names and email addresses so you can contact, contact us directly if you'd like. So we put together this panel to give a wide perspective on grants that are available for digital work in medieval studies. So there's a variety of perspectives, including a program officer, someone who's served on review panels, faculty and staff who received various different types of grants from foundations, universities, the NEH, of course, and um, in various areas, including preservation, outreach, um, and developing new methods and tools for research. I'm going to introduce each speaker um, before they talk, and then please hold your questions until the end. But we, the idea is to have an informal discussion around um, various ways of, of funding your DH project uh, with people who've had a lot of experience um, in various areas. So we're going to start out um, with our first speaker, Jennifer Cerventi, who is a, pro, a senior program officer in the Office of Digital Humanities at the National um, Endowment for the Humanities. She coordinates the Institutes for Advanced Topics in Digital Humanities program and also works with Digital Humanities Advancement Grants and uh, Digging into Data Challenge programs. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to talk about the NEH grants and um, things that are available for digital projects. Thank you. Um, I'd also, um, so I, hopefully you all are seeing um, the screen and I wanna also take this opportunity to introduce you to a new colleague at the, the National Endowment for the Humanities and a new member of the Office of Digital Humanities team in particular, and that's Bethany Farrell. She's our new program specialist. Um, so we are, she's only been with us for about three months, but we're trying to introduce her to the range of work that we do um, because she'll also be on the road for us um, as well. So we thought this would be a good opportunity. She's an art historian, so I think she's keen to sort of learn and hear from, from you since we know that many of those who work in medieval studies have an art historian background. So, um, but part of why I wanted uh, Bethany to join us, she's um, available on screen, is to put faces to names um, and to remind you that NEH, <laughs> much like Soil and Green, NEH is people, and you as scholars, as um, really uh, as Americans, as taxpayers, should feel comfortable writing to us with questions. Um, and um, you now know someone, you now know two people at the NEH. So if you also have questions about other NEH programs not in the Office of Digital Humanities and would like a referral, we're happy to do that as well. Um, one nice thing about being at a very small federal agency is we do know our colleagues and we know them well and we like them. So we're, we're very happy to do that. Um, um, but let's see if I can, there we go. Oh, but we're talking about digital humanities. If there's one takeaway from today's discussion is that the Office of Digital Humanities is not the only funder of digital humanities work within um, the NEH. Um, and so it's often, how, how does your work intersect with the digital humanities? 
And what do you need money to do? Is it research? Is it for teaching, for curriculum development? Is it for service to the field in some way, such as hosting an institute um, for, the, for the field? Is it writing a report about the state of digital humanities and medieval studies, for example? Um, we may have a grant program, but they're not all in the Office of Digital Humanities. And I'm not gonna talk about a lot of different um, funding opportunities. That, that in and of itself we could take you know, hours. What I do wanna do is show you where you can find things on your own. You're a humanity scholar, you're great at research, but let's sort of show you where you can find things. So of course you always start with the NEH page, NEH.gov. Um, and at the top, you'll see the, um, the link for grants. And two things that I wanted to point out to you that I think might be of particular interest. One is to search all the grant programs. And one is our professional development link for information about the um, Institute's program in our Division of Education programs and also the Institutes for Advanced Topics um, in the Office of Digital Humanities. Um, as we make them available, as the websites for those, uh, the current um, iteration of or current slate of programs becomes available, we will make them available on this section of the NEH website. And something to keep in mind for the Office of Digital Humanities is many of our, our funding opportunities, our professional development opportunities can cut across sort of discipline. So you'll see one um, when the website becomes available called Mathematics for Humanists. I think um, those would be appeal to a range of humanities scholars and humanities professionals. They don't, you don't have to be limited to one discipline. Some are sort of more narrowly bound, but some are very widely um, uh, designed. Um, we'll have one on developing open educational resources. We'll have another one on digital scholarly publishing. So, which is a long way of saying, um, don't only limit yourself for searching for ones within medieval studies, because many of them are designed specifically to appeal to a broad range of, of humanities disciplines. And I also want to sort of remind you, and Bethany, I know is going to start popping some links into the chat as well. Um, NH has have worked very hard to develop resources for applicants. We have some specific web guides to help you navigate the variety of digital humanities opportunities. If you are at or know colleagues who are at small regional or minority serving institutions, we've developed a specific guide for that because that's a particular sort of um, acknowledgement that NEH needs to do more in that space and helping folks. The first step is helping folks understand sort of what's available to them. We also have for every um, NEH program, we, also, we offer, um, offer webinars. Um, many of them are live, and then we make the recordings available. We offer virtual office hours. You can check lists of awards from previous competitions. Use those samples of previously funded projects judiciously um, as what's possible, but not, what's not the only thing. You can always talk to NEH program staff. And of course, you'll notice that um, for many of our programs, we can review drafts before the application deadline. And a, a, a quick tip as you um, sort of search for, for funding opportunities for perhaps a digitally inflected project, just because it doesn't have digital in the title doesn't mean that they don't fund work in that space. So um, one of the links, and this is the, the web page that I think you'll want to spend some time looking at, is a guide that my colleague Sheila Brennan has put together called what grant program fits my digital project. And we do try to update it as new programs become available as well. So it it's, um, it's, remains useful. One of the um, resources that we have available is our database of funded projects. And I did wanna point out that under field of project, medieval studies is one of the options you can search under to see what, what has been done in that space in the past. But I also wanna encourage you to use the keywords and other ways of searching because medieval studies I don't have to tell you, it's a very broad and changing sort of uh, discipline. So these are all self-selected by the applicants. So um, someone who's working in what um, I might categorize as medieval studies and might've checked the box may not have checked the box. So don't use um, that link as your only way of finding medieval studies projects, but I wanted to point out that it's there for you. And finally, I wanna leave you with ways to stay involved and, and get involved. Um, with NEH. Um, certainly apply. We are a funding agency. That is our reason for being, to promote the humanities through funding work out um, in the United States, but also apply again. Sometimes it takes two, sometimes it takes three times before a project is funded. So 
you are our people. We are your funding body. So stick with us. Um, the fact of the matter is we have more projects that really are worthy of funding than we have funds for. So sometimes it takes a couple of times um, to be uh, funded. Apply to attend one of those NEH funded professional development opportunities. Of course, we want you to um, volunteer to be an evaluator for NEH. Um, if only to give your fellow evaluators a time off so that we're not going back to the same pool again and again. But it's also incredibly important to NEH that our um, panels, the review panels represent the breadth and depth of the excellent work in the humanities that's happening across the country. We need to have a range of institutions. We need to make sure we have geographic representation. So if we ask, seriously consider saying yes. If you can't do it that time, just tell us not this time, but ask again and rest assured we will in fact um, ask again. Um, we do have a range of NEH newsletters. We want you to um, keep up with what NEH is doing. It's often the case that we have new programs that are announced. Sometimes they're just one time or a very short time and we want you to know about it. it Nothing pains me further than someone writing to us that says, oh, I just saw this announcement. When is the next deadline? And the fact of the matter is that that was the third of the last three deadlines that we were offering for that program. So we ask that you keep up with what we're doing and in the newsletters are good ways of doing that. But we promise we don't spam you every day. We do offer um, summer internship opportunities. And so we also ask you to be our ambassadors on your own campus. When those opportunities are announced, if you have some great students that you think would benefit and might enjoy, um, they are paid internships. In the past few years, they have been virtual ones. And my understanding is they will at least continue in some way, um, hopefully in some either virtual or hybrid form. Um, we've been really pleased with the range of uh, represent, uh, internships we've been able to offer. Um, if you have a great student in one of your medieval studies course who's actually an accounting major, we often we have um, opportunities for interning with our grants management office, for example. So um, keep an eye out for those opportunities and share them with some of your students that you think may benefit. And um, do keep in mind, I would say get to know Humanities Texas, but also get to know your state humanities councils in general. Actually, I think I've lost my screen. I'll just I'll start back with this one. Um, your state humanities councils can do amazing work. And um, don't think that just because you're working in medieval studies, they are not interested in what you're doing. I'm pleased to see the um, DC Humanities Council has just funded a project out of Catholic University called Medieval DC, where they're looking at medieval influences in Washington DC through architecture, through collections, through um, rhetoric. So don't think that you can't do um, public humanities projects. You absolutely can, and there are funding streams for that as well. So I will actually stop sharing um, and um, come back, but I wanted to leave you with um, some ways of getting involved with NEH and taking advantage of the range of funding opportunities that we have and to know about the resources we have available. Okay, so let's see if I can share. There we go. Thank you so much, um, Jennifer. And. Uh, let, we will do the questions at the end. So I'll go ahead with um, our next speaker is Roger Martinez Davila, who is a professor of history at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And he has himself received funding from multiple sources, including an NEH Institute for Advanced Topics. So take it away, Roger. Hi, Lynn, and hi, colleagues. And um, I just wanted to thank Lynn again for the for the substantial subvention she gave me today to present here. It's about $2,000. I know all of us got that same amount of money. So I just wanted to thank you again. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, so I'll, I'll do this really quickly. Of course, there's no subvention at all, but that's not why we do this, right? We do this because we're really fascinated with the work and then trying out some new ideas and moving uh, and maybe, you know, moving our, our, our fields forward. I'm primarily a medieval Spanish historian with a specialty in archives, but have over time, like many of you, uh, kind of self-trained. And so I think that would be my first point is, uh, and I think I just realized this last week when I was working with my own office to sponsor programs, and I thought, actually, no one knows what they're doing. I mean, they really don't know what they're doing. We're all kind of making it up as we go. So to some extent, my first kind of like point to all of you in your grant writing is, I would say in the way that you weren't trained as a specialist, that you should really be willing to experiment. 
it's really important to kind of really consider new ways of doing things that have never been done and, you know, perceive potentially failure as like actually the best outcome in some ways, because that means you really are kind of testing. So you use the, use these grant opportunities, I think, to test new ideas. And that that's an essential point that I would really uh, concentrate on. And in fact, uh, in a grant opportunity, I'm working with colleagues in Europe because the European side is often more generous than the, uh, the, universe, uh, the United States side. Um, we're working on a project uh, grant on developing an artificial intelligent uh, colleague that we would grow from an undergraduate to a senior scholar. And, you know, while I think all of us have certain concerns about AI and things like that, we certainly feel like none of us actually are experts in this field, but we don't think that there really are experts yet. So we kind of have a responsibility as humanists to kind of really dive into this field, as well as to kind of um, really use those technologies to understand what does it mean to be, um, what's unique about being a human, as opposed to being the machines and tools we create. So we can ask really fundamental questions. So that's the second point that I would make about any kind of grants that you're working on is, is stay true to your roots, which is Absolutely. continue to do this work of humanities work, but also text the technology. Um, always turn back to figuring out, well, then, you know, where, where do we end at the end? So what were those big kind of questions is all, always as medievalists as we think about the, the medi medieval pedagogy, the scholastic movement and things like that. How can we kind of really return to those fundamental questions? The last thing I would leave you, and I, I promised Lynn I wouldn't share anything, but of course I will, um, is just a, a, just a point about dissemination, right? And dissemination is always, I think, an important piece. So just sharing my screen, just to remind you, I think we're all trained as these scholarly academics that you know we need to publish peer review articles. And in terms of the kind of collaborative work that Lynn and I are doing on this Institute for Advanced Digital uh, Humanities Topics, um, one of the, I think the key things is just kind of getting the word out. So, you know, you know, remind yourself that actually, you know, a proper website that's hosted at your university can make a big difference. And I would say a big part of all our work is really about communicating the work of colleagues. So what we've really tried to do, even in very kind of like very um, nuts and bolts ways, tried to create like video uh, descriptions of projects that people are working on um, and things like that, just so that we can communicate who's on the forefront, you know, new PhD candidates, as well as associate professors and senior scholars. So that dissemination in non-traditional ways is really important. Obviously with any kind of grant work, continuously trying to figure out to kind of um, communicate this information. So again, like what we're trying to do as a culminating element of our grant, which I think is really important for outcomes that signal back to the funding agencies that you deliver, is this is um, in January after our institute had just ends in December, we will be hosting a, a roundtable and workshop on the immersive global, global middle ages at the American Historical uh, Association. And what's important is like, I'm just going to kind of convene, but all the panel discussions are our participants. So in this way, it's a great way actually to kind of promote your colleagues' work and yours at the same time, right? So now we've kind of decentered ourselves and kind of push our colleagues up. And that's that's kind of a fun thing to do because it's uh, it's nice to be generous when you can be. The last thing too is just, you know, kind of using these other tools that we have out there, you know, the social media of of academics like Academia EDU. And so um, when possible, even though this doesn't have a lot of views, you know, kind of putting uh, brief summaries about what, what you're doing. And in fact, we've even posted up our complete grant application here just to share, hey, this is what we did. It ended up working out, but I think that's a great way also in the end, in terms of dissemination, it's just figuring out what are the different avenues you can communicate. So. Obviously, again, we're always trying to double up on things. So Lynn and I are simultaneously working on a, a Cambridge University elements based off this institute. So it's just like, how do you kind of pile on different things so that you can get maximum benefit out of it? We've been really fortunate in the sense that we have great participants in our institute. They've been very inspiring. 
And that's kind of, I would say, kind of, it keeps Lynn and I working, I think, very consistently because we realize kind of that responsibility to each other. So that's a long way of saying in terms of grants, it really is about kind of that intellectual creativity and thinking that, you know, there is no expert here. So be willing to take those chances to kind of returning to those humanistic roots always because, you know, we're not NSF. These are not NSF grants. We really want to come back to the audience that you're trying to speak to. And then finally, just about dissemination, think about, you know, traditional, non-traditional, um, that will also find you collaborators, which is a lot of fun. So thank you. Thanks so much, Roger. Um, our next speaker uh, is David Michelson, who is Associate Professor of History of Christianity at Vanderbilt University. He's a PI for the Syriaca.org reference portal, and that has been funded by the NEH, by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and other foundations and institutions. So. Um, Thank you, David. Uh, I'll hand it to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Lynn. And uh, yes, also nice to see people who've helped me along the way, Jennifer uh, especially, and uh, Roger and Dorothy. Uh, I really enjoyed watching the Global Middle Ages. Um, and uh, I'm I'm uh, also work in Syriac studies, so uh, kind of a different path maybe than uh, Western medieval studies. Um, uh, the comments I have are, are mainly sort of just practical, like I thought I'd just kind of practically describe my experience, which is sounds very similar to what Roger has been saying about, you know, there's a good, good deal of, well, you've just got to teach yourself and learn by example. Uh, this is not something that your grad program will train you for. And in my experience, might not even be something that your institution where you're employed will incentivize uh, or initially reward uh, until after, maybe after you've actually accomplished it. So um, uh, what would I say? Well, first to underline that the NEH is super uh, approachable. In fact, um, she's now uh, retired, but Helena Guerra uh, was the director of preservation and access who met with me as a, I think a second year assistant professor and I just kind of showed up at the NEH office. I didn't even know, you know, were you really allowed to visit or what? Uh, and really just walked me through the process. And then that's been my experience uh, working with the NEH since. We've had three grants, all from the Division of Preservation and Access. And I'm going to put their link in the chat um, just because uh, this is a good example of what Jennifer was saying of, uh, you know, don't just think of the Office of Digital Humanities. Um, certainly for those of us who work with manuscripts, especially, but also dictionaries, encyclopedias. Um, the NEH has a long history of supporting those digitally, um, even before there was an Office of Digital Humanities, um, which actually then brings me to the next sort of practical question. So let's say you wanted to get started on, uh, you have an idea for a project and you want to get started on applying for grants. What we did was we just went and found the projects that existed that were closest to ours. So in our case, it was the Encyclopedia Ironica at Columbia. And then we looked and said, okay, well, who funded them? It was the NEH Preservation and Access. So then we went to the NEH. Uh, and um, something people don't necessarily realize is that for um, public funding, you can request slightly redacted copies of successful grant applications. And that's very, very useful, especially if you're just getting started. You can see, okay, what sort of things worked, et cetera. The NEH usually publishes um, uh, some, some examples online, but if you're aware of a specific project the NEH has funded, you can request that project's application. They remove personal you know, salary information and things like that. So I would strongly encourage you to do that. And then uh, also becoming a reviewer is useful because, of course, then you're reading current applications, you're learning what are the best practices uh, in the field as well. So um, there's a good deal of, of just sort of learning that prose and, and that approach um, and then get asking for the feedback. So we did not get any H funding on our first attempt, but the reviewers comments were really essential. Then and then we were successful on a on a second attempt, and then we were unsuccessful on a third attempt, and a successful on a fourth attempt. So, uh, you know that that feedback process um, from the reviewers is is very very valuable, and and you should take take advantage of it. 
also because it um, again will m make you aware of best practices in digital humanities, even in maybe your own domain that you might not might not be aware of. Um, uh, related to that, we also found it useful to take this sort of uh, pilot project and then expand and then, you know, uh, apply for a third grant that's a sort of, okay, now we're going to do 2.0, right? So you could think of your first grant gets you to 0.1 beta, your second grant gets you to 1.0. And if you get it, you know, are fortunate enough to get a third grant, that's for version 2.0. So really structure your project in that way. I think also that funders tend to be more comfortable giving, say, $100,000 to someone who was successful with $20,000. So, um, you know, building that that trek record, um, which which I would say in our case, and I don't know if this is for others, but we were really successful in pairing grants with foundations and the NEH or pairing, um, you know, getting a small grant from I have two other um, co-PIs. Um, Dan Schwartz at Texas A&M University and Jean-Nicole Mellon Saint Laurent at Marquette University, and um, we could often pair a small grant from one of our home institutions, and then use that to match towards a larger grant from a foundation or a federal agency. Um, and we had a lot of success with that approach. Um, I think we've also had success uh, in that our projects were often collaborative, uh, and you know I sort of heard that in Roger's remarks as well. Um, and it, including that the funders like to see different institutions. So just to sort of knock on on my institution, you know, Vanderbilt has a little bit of elite wealthy university cachet to it, whereas Texas A&M University or Marquette, uh, we found the funders were actually more interested in some ways in supporting a project at one of those schools that, that might not necessarily get this sort of grant more often. Um, uh, and then that brings me to, I think, sort of the last um, way I'd describe what we've done, which is uh, having collaborators also in other domains that that one might not think of. So uh, in our case, it's been especially librarians. So uh, I know Don Childress was uh, not able to join us, but uh, at UCLA in the libraries, we've had a lot of success collaborating and even joint applying for grants with librarians. Um, and then uh, Roger mentioned that the, the funding in Europe is often much uh, larger. Interestingly, though, there are some things that our institutions here have more ready access to, uh, especially just the mechanics of hosting a digital project. So we've had a good deal of success of colleagues applying for, say, an ERC grant in Europe, and then they're subcontracting with us for the sort of technical aspects that their home institution might not have uh, in-house resources for. Um, so to just sort of be creative about, uh, you know, collaborate as far as wide um, as you can. Um, yeah, I think that's everything uh, that, that I would suggest based on our experience. Um, we've also had success with, with foundations. That's a much more opaque world. Uh, and uh, also requires working sometimes with your university's development office. Um, so uh, I, I would just give a, a democratic uh, two thumbs up to the NEH as an excellent place where I learned how the grant process worked and then was able to take that to uh, you know other places. Certainly the Mellon Foundation I found to be very transparent and, and uh, assisting. Um, uh, I'd also wanna mention the ACLS uh, American Council of Learned Societies has a number of uh, grants. Uh, we haven't had one of those, but um, I think would uh, are a very good fit for medieval studies. And if you look at what they've funded in the past, would be similar to things people might hear might be interested in. Um, great. I look forward to taking questions. Thank you so much, David. Um, so our final panelist is Dorothy Kim, who is Assistant Professor of English at Brandeis University. And um, she works both in theoretical and practical digital humanities. And so uh, she has some very interesting perspectives. Uh, in addition to being awarded several grants, including one from the NEH uh, for scholarly, scholarly editions and translations, um, she has uh, served on grant review boards, and uh, I think many times. And so that's a, that's a great perspective. So thank you so much for talking, Dorothy. Hi, everyone. So I actually want to start out by saying 
I teach the digital methods class for graduate students on my campus. And their final assignment is to actually, they have to choose a project eventually as we go through the various methods of the various areas. And um, they have to write their their final project slash paper for me is to write a mock grant proposal that I evaluate. <laughs> so um, some of them have chosen in the past to do NEHs. Some of them have done other things depending on what their project parameters have been. And in this last iteration, the graduate student um, who is working in um, uh, digital Caribbean studies actually applied, did her grant proposal from a local, uh, off of a local, GH grant in the Boston area, and she then actually applied for it and got it. So I think this is also an interesting way to think about how to kind of, you know, prepare uh, people ahead of time. I think the thing that really um, freaked the students out once they started to work through the grant materials, and as we talked about things like labor, is um, the budgeting and cost. Um, they had no idea the overhead percentages or these things or what the sort of standards depending on what your institution's university labor cost frameouts are so once they started to kind of have to actually work that they realized oh my god this like what is the most expensive thing is actually the labor right and then the university overhead depending on your institution and so they were really um they were really surprised because I think they often think, oh my God, this like several hundred thousand dollar grant, that's so much money. And then they started to like cut all the bits that go to different things. And they were just like, so now we have how much left <laughs> to do this other stuff. So um, if nothing else, it's actually an interesting way to have at least graduate students sort of understand some of the complicated um more administrative budgeting, you know, interface with grants office um, stuff that I think they never think about beyond just the, the what they expect is like, well, have you uh, written the grant proposal so the clarity of the project is there and you've hit all those things. So um, uh, I recommend it. I think it's actually a really interesting exercise and it gives them a chance to kind of see if this is the kind of thing they are interested in. Um, and are into. Um, so I've reviewed for the NEH twice, and um, I have, um, um, which has always been very interesting. Um, and I just wanted to say in general, because they tell us to say this, I cannot talk about the specifics of any application, but I will talk about general um, issues, right? Um, and so I think one of the things uh, um, to think about is that I feel as if the NEH out of so many granting agencies out of the US government, the NEH website is actually quite decently user-friendly and they update their criteria every year and they give a very uh, specific outline to like what is required, what they want, what the criteria frameouts are. Um, and as someone who has been sort of like digging in some other sort of pots of uh, funding, including foundations, which as um, David says, steeply opaque and very strange, right? As someone who's just spent several years dealing with the melon, um, uh, the NH is very straightforward. They will, uh, you have all the information, they have people who will talk to you, um, and also you can do drafts, right? So to usually about two months ahead of time, I recommend that if at all possible, because that really helps um, give the feedback to see what you can fine tune, right? Um, and I would say the other thing is, um, let me just say that, you know, some of the other agencies, the, the interface feels like it's from the 90s, along with the pixelated, um, you know, like dot matrix, like text. Um, and you cannot actually find instructions or you have to do an archive search of instructions and maybe you get one from like the previous five years. So um, be really happy if you're applying for an NEH. It's, a, it's actually a good place to sort of think about what all these bits um, are. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so what I have here is basically this is the this year's cycle for scholarly editions and translations, the call. And what they have is the application review information and they give you the criteria. And I think that people, um, I think sometimes when we think, oh, we've worked out all the tech stuff, we've worked out you know, the narrative, we've worked out some of this other stuff, um, they give you the sort of breakdown. And I think often 
sometimes people forget the, the first thing, right? Because I think we all sort of assume that, of course, it's significant, right? But in a general way, let us just say that review committees often actually ask, want very clear explanation of number one. And I think academics or collab like groups of applications sometimes forget that this actually is something you have to articulate. So this is the significance, the intellectual significance of the proposed text for humanity scholars, the need for a scholarly edition or translation of the material, and additions potential to stimulate new scholarship, right? We may just assume that everyone's like, well, of course, they haven't edited this thing or done this translation in a couple of decades. So there, it is significant, right? But the committee is usually made not of uh, specialists only in one area, so it's usually a very wide group. They may or may not have any kind of like contact or information in your particular text, so they actually require, uh, they really need this to be answered fairly upfront in very clear ways, right? Because this can potentially, like this absence can potentially spike your review, all right? It is actually a scoring like criteria, right? So if you don't articulate this, even if the rest of the application is great, this causes an issue. Um, and then similarly, you know, you see the other parts, right? Methods and execution, collaborators, work plan and productivity, publication goals. I think one thing to think about with methods and execution, and then we might get into it when we look at the narrative part, is that, um, Digital humanity stuff is kind of interesting because most things don't get published until way past or like discussions of projects and methods don't get published until way past the projects like, you know, ladder legs, right? Occasionally you have like uh, spaces like reviews in DH where you can actually get projects sort of reviewed in process, but the only way to figure out what are the best methods or what are people doing is you have to actually go to conference panels, right? Or like various kinds of panels, possibly conferences. I would suggest going to DHSI or the European DH conference, right? Because then you can get a lot of people and a lot of different things, right? Because what you need to see is what are the projects in process. And usually people will actually present like, this is a project that I'm working on. These are some of the problems I want feedback. This is the sort of method I'm interested in. And so people can kind of, um, sort of uh, give back critique or helpful suggestions. Oh, have you seen this project or this project? Or I heard someone's working on this. So a lot of it is actually networked uh, presentation things that will give you a sense of what the, the most recent practices or best practices are in your particular angle into a digital humanities project. So Sometimes I think people sort of feel that, oh, we only need to talk about the projects that are now like complete or live. And I'm like, the reviewers at times are often deeply in these spaces and will wonder why you haven't talked about certain projects that they've seen being presented at a couple of places. So they know it's not like super obscure, if that makes sense. Where like, I saw that presented at X and I also saw that presentation at Y. And, you know, there's been discussion about that on some, you know, X or Y. I'm really surprised this person doesn't know or this project doesn't know about this particular method to address this, if that makes sense. So I think that's, so the, like what previously, I don't know if they still call it this, what's called the environmental scan, that is actually incredibly important because it gives us uh, reviewers a sense of, do you know what the lay of the land is and the context of your project? And what um, are you in conversation? And you can make decisions that you've rejected certain methods and you can explain why and that's totally fine, right? Um, that is the way you kind of figure that out. But uh, I think one of the things is that reviewers want to know that you, you are coming into this knowledgeable and also have a kind of sense of what the sort of conversations are and best practices. And unfortunately that is, unlike maybe other kinds of uh, grant proposals in other fields, that actually does require a kind of um, networked uh, 
almost presentation word of mouth conversation because a lot of these projects don't you don't know about them unless you actually have seen or people have talked to you about it or have sort of said oh so and so is working on this that sort of thing so it's not something that you can cite in a bibliography necessarily right because it's not necessarily live no one's written about it yet or done a write-up so you have to kind of um, I mean, this is a question where people always ask me, why do you, I do one of the foundational classes at DHSI and they're always like, why do you do it? I'm like, I have uh, various reasons, but one of the reasons is I actually get to go and figure out what people are doing, right? Like it gives me every year a sense of like what the projects are in a wide area of digital humanities and where people are sort of moving in different directions or, you know, having conversations with people I can't ever see, for instance, like DJ Risley, right? I can't see him. He's like, He's like, you know, in the Middle East all right, all the time. But if I go to DHSI, I can actually have a, a very long conversation and pick his brain about a bunch of different things. Right. So, you know, um, I think this is one of the things as well, that this is where um, reviewers may be like, OK, I'm really surprised this hasn't been like these projects haven't been discussed in doing this. Right. So because they want to make sure you are uh, logically and soundly thinking through what you've decided to do and how, right? And obviously the rest, collaborators, work plan, productivity, um, publication goals um, are important. And one of the things I will say with the publication goals, um, scholarly editions and translations, depending on the grant, they will have guidelines about whether they think this should be digital or not, or what the criteria are. And there are reasons why certain things should not necessarily be digital for widest dissemination. Um, projects that, you know, include things that want to circulate widely, say, in certain continents where there is not really great internet access, it makes more sense to do uh, like paperback, right? So there could be, but you have, there could be reasons for different kinds of dissemination and publication, but you have to be very clear as to what that is, right? Um, and then one of the other things is that um, uh, the, I uh, will see if I can get to the narrow part, hold on, uh, in the guidelines, as they talk about narrative, right, and I think that's one of the places where people spend a lot of time thinking through, and as you should, um, there is a discussion about best practices, and there's pointing to certain kinds of, hold on, there we are, uh, guidelines that get updated quite like every so often, every couple of years, right? And so the number one thing here in, um, I would say, the methods and, and execution is even as the, uh, the call has told you to look at the ADE, right? The Association for Documentary Editing, right? As well as the MLA Committee on Scholarly Editions, and their ongoing updates of what is best practices, if this is not actually addressed, that is a big issue. Right? <laughs> and in the other grant proposals and CFPs calls, right, they will, there will be other ones that people will probably point to, right? But this is the one I know intimately, um, really, really closely. The MLA guideline has been updated multiple times, right? And so they have been very, very clear, right? Um, and uh, I think this also creates, so you have to be very um, close to what is being asked for and understand that um, NEH has been really good about pointing to what they see as the sort of rubrics for best practice. And you have, have to absolutely you know, address this, right, in various ways, right? But, you know, I, I feel the MLA guidelines are really, really clear and have been updated really clearly. Ditto for the ADE. So, you know, it has to be something that is sort of really, really um, dealt with as soon as possible to show the reviewers that you actually know what you're doing, right? Um, and sometimes this means that, you know, um, I, in general, I and a couple of other reviewers in the past have, in our groups, have really loved when when uh, project proposals have just given us the appendix where they've given us their entire like editorial guideline from digital to like 
uh, critical and we're like, yes, <laughs> that makes it really easy. You guys have like, you know, fulfilled this particular thing. And now we can move on and talk about this other part of the criteria of the application, right? So, so these are some of the things, but those are the things that I think um, hopefully is helpful from a reviewer point of view that a lot of projects forget number one, all right? <laughs> Or sort of think that it's a kind of, you know, oh, of course we know why it's significant, but that will get you scored down and dinged, right, if you don't actually address that. And then in the other section, to be really, really um, uh, aware and knowledgeable of what is happening in your area and in, in the methods you're interested in, and to find out from people, from, you know, conference presentations, what's going out what's happening out there, and then to be very clear about addressing the guidelines that are put on the call. So I think I'll stop there. Well, thank you so helpful. much, Ruthie. That's great. Um, so we are going to open it up to questions right now, and I'd like to encourage you just to unmute and talk. I think it feels more um, personal and, you know, by all means, uh, give your video too if you want or, or not. But I will try to also read the chat if you put it in there, but I, it would be great if you could just ask the question. Um, you can you can raise your hand or you can just start start talking. So do we have any questions? While folks are thinking, I, I want to build on what Dorothy had to say in how you read a notice of funding opportunity, which is what we call an, an application guide, the application guidelines, because it's what also we ask our peer reviewers to use and only that. They don't get to bring in any other information. You live and die by your notice of funding opportunity. So your goal as an applicant, and this is true not only for NEH, but for um, most programs in the humanities that I'm aware of, use those the guidelines in the notice of funding opportunity to prepare your application because you want to make reading your application as easy as possible for the peer reviewers. Do not make them struggle to find things that we've asked you to put in the narrative by burying it in the appendix. They have a lot to read. Sometimes they read before they meet. Other times they just read and offer comments. But use the notice of funding opportunity as a roadmap for preparing your applications. Keep an eye on what's required. Make sure it's there. Because if we require something and it's not there, it won't even get to the peer reviewers. It won't get to Dorothy and Roger and David. It will. Um, we want to make sure that not only you are competitive, you even meet that eligibility um, threshold. So making sure that you sort of follow that notice of funding opportunities. We've given you sort of what you need to put in there so that the peer reviewers can judge on um, on the peer review criteria um, and. Um, We've actually now mapped the peer review criteria to specific parts of the application. Um, and we hope you find that helpful. Um, and if you have a four page narrative, do not spend three pages as much as you could on the first review criteria and you don't get to the other parts of the application. Um, make sure you balance your application to that you're able to respond to all of the sections so that they map well and can score high in all parts of the review um, process. Just going to throw out there too, from my own perspective, that um, we we did talk about various places that you can find grants, but your own institution probably has some little grants, um, and it might not be much. It might be to you know have invite a scholar. I know the Southeastern Conference has a, a special grant. You can invite other faculty from the Southeastern Conference to come and talk, and I've used that uh, before, and just kind of using these small funding amounts to build up until you're ready to apply for a grant. And that's a question that I guess I'm, I would throw out there for um, Jennifer and everyone else who has applied is at, at what point do you know your project is uh, ready and how do you best determine which one, uh, I'm thinking specifically of the different levels of advancement grants, but and I know there's a website with a lot of information on it. So of course, yes, people should should look at that, but just this sense of when to um, go for funding and what level. It's, it's sometimes not a clear, um, we, we don't, if you have too clear of a line, you run the risk of projects falling between them. So, which is a long way of saying, 
that's what you pay us for. That is our job is to help you a navigate to the right program. And for those programs that offer multiple funding levels to find the right one that you'll be ready to apply for at the time of application. Because you, um, you do live and die by the application materials. You don't get to update them or augment them after you submit them. So make, sh make sure that you're making the, the strongest case possible for the level that you're asking for support for at the time of application. So if say you want to, you think you're ready for a level two, but you don't have anything to show the panels, they're going to expect to see that, for example, for the digital humanities advancement grant. Um, we've, we've worked quite hard to update the notice of funding opportunities to give examples of what sort of activities would be appropriate at different levels of funding as well, in part because we've we heard from applicants that they weren't sure. Um, and so we tried to be clear, but you should never hesitate to send us an inquiry. And even if you miss that draft deadline for a particular program, we are still always available to um, answer questions before that deadline. Once the applications come in, we put on sort of a slightly different hat to ensure a full and fair review of all applications that come in to determine eligibility and to make sure that they get a full and fair review. But before the deadline, as potential applicants, we are here for you and we, we really would rather you call us before a deadline. Um, we know it, we ask a lot of you as applicants. Um, and so it is worth your time to try to ask for a uh, 30 minute call to make sure we find the right um, funding opportunity for you. It is very painful when we see an application that is minimally eligible in our program, so has to go through the review process, when it would be actually much more competitive in another funding opportunity. Um, and if we had had that call, we as NEH staff members can't switch grant applications around after they're submitted. You're kind of stuck with the grant program you apply to um, until you hear the results. So um, it really um, um, is worth your time to ask beforehand if you're, just, if you're not sure. Um, and I and the rest of my colleagues in not only the Office of Digital Humanities, but across the endowment, really want to have those conversations. And I know it can seem off-putting. You see a, an, an email address, it's preservation at neh.gov or institutes at neh.gov. Rest assured, there are people behind those um, emails. Everyone in the Office of Digital Humanities keeps an eye on odh at neh.gov. So there, you will get a response. Um, you're not... Um, any, I know some of you send an email um, to your healthcare system to the help box and you don't even know if anyone got it. That is not the case with NEH <laughs> with the emails at NEH.gov. But now that you've made it to this meeting, to this gathering, you now know Bethany and Bethany and I, you're also welcome just to write to us specifically and we will we will help you find the right person if we're not the right person. So thank you so much. Yeah, it, it can be confusing. We are not unaware that we have lots of funding opportunities. That's what's a blessing blessing and a curse. Um, and so we really do want to spend some time with you to make sure to find out what you need funding for, who your audience is for the project, um, what stage of the project you're at. Um, that, that, is, that is what we're, what we have, um, we're experts in at NEH. Great. And we actually do have medievalists on staff as well. Um, so we, you know, uh -huh. you can talk to your folks <laughs> if you really want to, um, in our research division, we have a wonderful medievalist as well. So, um. Okay, anybody else? Got any questions out there? All right. Oh, Dave, go ahead. Uh, I, if the uh, people who haven't spoken want to ask, they should go first. But I, as long as we have you here, I do have a uh, I something I've noticed that's changed in different directions over time is the request for or importance of or or I think now it's maybe swung towards it's uh, not it's more discouraged uh, having letters of support from other scholars in your application. Could you mm -hmm. comment on you know what's the current sort sure. of at the it, NEA? It, 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 it does differ by program. Um, it, uh, most programs, if you have, um, participants outside of your own institution do ask for letters of commitment, but let's think about letters of support differently. And it is often the case that longstanding projects from often highly prestigious institutions, it's easier to get a letter of support. Um, it disadvantages applicants from small, less resourced institutions. 
So we, particularly in the Office of Digital Humanities, have really discouraged letters of support. We have heard from panels that they often don't add much to the application, but they can disadvantage um, applicants even at the pre-application stage thinking, oh, I can't get the leaders of the Medieval Academy to write me a letter of support. Why would I even bother to apply? So difference from letter of commitment than letter of support. And keep in mind for some of our individual funding opportunities, letters of recommendation are still required. So understand the differences between the different types of letters. And if you're asked to write for a, a, a program, understand the type of letter that you're writing. If you're committing to a project that's different from writing, writing a letter of support, which is also different from writing, say, a letter of recommendation for the fellowships program. So it will be clear in that particular funding opportunity, the different types of letters, and certainly in the Office of Digital Humanities, why we um, decided to not um, sort of require or even allow letters of support. There, A, there are a lot to ask, and a lot to ask. You, you're always being asked to light writers of support for lots of things. Let's take that off your plate um, and make sure that if someone is good enough to write a letter of support for you, why not they just have them as be part of your advisory board um, and have them write a letter of commitment? So think of it that way. Does that make sense, David? For and But it does vary from different programs, but we didn't want to disadvantage sort of particularly early career scholars who may not be able to get those letters of support because they're, they're still established themselves in the field and may need an NIH grant to do that, um, or scholars um, and projects at less resource institutions as well. So, Terrific. And I, I think that really sends a message to everyone on the call here. Like, if you have an idea, no matter what stage you're at in your career, bring it, bring it to the NEH to, you know, get started on the process. You are welcome. Great. Well, thank you all, um, particularly the panelists. So thank you very much for coming and and talking to everyone about the different grant opportunities and how to approach it. But also uh, we've recorded this, so it'll be available for um, others to look at later. Uh, I'm not sure what the Medieval Academy's uh, process for that is. So, um, but I did note that they that it, it was recorded. Um, I. I did want to leave you with uh, a reminder that the Committee on Digital Humanities and Media Studies uh, is here for you, <laughs> and we would like to um, improve and uh, increase our programming and um, awareness around medieval digital projects. So I am putting um, up our emails uh, right now, uh, just kind of as a final slide screen. And please feel free to take a screenshot of that or write any of us with ideas for more programming. And please do join us when we start uh, our showcase. It'll be informal and it'll be a fun way to get to know some of the projects that are out there. As you've heard, it's, it's sometimes hard to know um, what others are doing. So if you wanna get an idea of what's going on in the field, we hope to help with that. So um, this is our, uh, step one, I'm sure I'm gonna, I'll share it. Um, you can see this uh, slide, hopefully, and uh, please do write to um, any of us to find out more about the Medieval Academy. But thank you again, and uh, we'll see you at the next workshop.